A warm welcome to all of our ISM members, our chapter partners, and our guests to today's program. Please be sure to utilize our chat and our Q&A area for any questions you might have for our speaker today. I will be recording this program and I will be sending the link out later today with your continuing educational credit. We also will be providing the uh, PowerPoint slides in the PDF format. So um, in case anybody is interested, we will be sending out the slides as well. Our topic for today is understanding classification HTSUS, the 2022 update. At this time, we have a very, very um, uh, packed program. So I'm going to be introducing our speaker, Kelly Raya. She's the Chief Operating Officer of Blue Tiger International. At this point, I'm going to turn the program over to Kelly. Thank you, Kathy. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. And today's topic, Understanding Classification, H2, HTSUS. Since we're based in the United States, we'll be talking about the HTSUS and also any changes or some of the changes that occurred for 2022. So depending on where you are about tariff classification, you may be very well experienced, well versed in tariff classifications. Um, but for those of you who are not so familiar with tariff classification, we'll kind of do a little bit of a refresher here. Um, and for those who are familiar and then um, to kind of go through some of the basics for those who are new to it. So we talk about tariff classification. We think about importing our goods or exporting our goods overseas. Well, there's a tariff classification describes what those goods are so that when customs overseas is looking at a product, they're seeing a 10 digit number that represents what that product is versus having something translated that this is a um, rubber duck in 10 different languages, okay? So um, we instead we say that this is a toy, a 9503, whatever that may be, and that would represent to customs in Japan, in England, in the US, that it's some sort of a toy for children or toy item. Um, so the World Customs Organization maintains the HTS. So if there's a global organization that comes together on these items, okay, and what these numbers are. And I always like to say for anyone who's looked at an HTS book, and looked at the, some of those descriptions in there and you say, who would sit there and do this? Well, this, these are the really nerdy people who like to do this stuff, right? And they're sitting there and putting into the tariff book 97 chapters of products, right? One chapters one through 97 represents products. And then chapters 98, 99 represent circumstances of import and also maybe some provisional changes, right? Those are, that's for the US. But that one through 97 piece, those are actual products. So when we're talking about globally, right? That there's a there's 10 digit number, um, the numbers are not necessarily identical, and that's important to understand because the chapters, the sections, the um, chapter 97 represents certain types of products. It will represent those products in every country so that the first four to six numbers of an HTS will be the same, okay, throughout the world, but those other numbers kind of tail off. And that's important to remember because when we talk about tariff classification and how do we determine tariffs, we need to be considering what the US tariff is if we're the importer of record, right? If we're, or we're a customs broker or we're responsible for those imports into the US, it's the HTS US. Now, why do I also make that point about the US? Because there are specific rules to the US classifications, right? There's specific um, ideas and things behind that. So we always have to also be noticing when we're the importer into the US, those additional US notes. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So how do we determine an, our HTS number? Who do we reach out to, right? Um, I have a product come across my desk. I can't figure out how do I establish what my um, Fitbit classification is, or my company is importing a brand new product, or maybe I just started working at a company and I don't think their HTS numbers look too good. All right. So we want to take, we want to know where do we get assistance for that? And a lot of times what companies will do is they'll look at their invoice and they'll ask their foreign supplier. They'll figure, hey, they have to export it out of their country. Or we might ask our foreign customer what we think the number is. 
but that's not always the right number. We may want to speak to our customs broker. Customs brokers are considered customs experts, right? They've demonstrated that they have a certain level of expertise with customs and border protection in obtaining their broker's license. So we may look at to speak with our customs broker. However, our customs broker doesn't necessarily know everything about our product. So we may find it very annoying when we say to our customs broker, hey, I have this rug I'm importing from India. What is the HTS number? And the broker comes back and starts to ask us, well, is it woven? Is it non-woven? What's it made out of? What's the thread count? And they start asking us what we seem, seem to feel are annoying questions, but really the broker doesn't know everything about our product. So how could they properly classify it? We may check with our shipping department or our receiving department. What kind of documents have you guys received from other, um, maybe the customs broker sent something or a freight forwarder sent something. Maybe there's a shipper letter of instruction you guys received. So we may be looking all over the place to try to to figure out where to get it. We may decide to go online and look, okay? And we'll talk about some of those resources online. But you know, there are places where you can right, query online. Come on, we've all well, let's admit it, we've all done it. What is the HTS for a plastic screw, okay, or a plastic um pencil? All right, you go in there and do that. Who, who's what's the accuracy of that right um is that right or wrong do we really care do we want to just push the shipment out the door well we're going to talk about the fact that we do need to care that hts number and we'll talk about schedule b's for those who export the hts numbers are the information that we report to customs and border protection or to the census bureau has to be accurate. It has to be correct. So that's why I have listed here customs and border protection. This is an option to go to cross, maybe do a customs ruling, uh, binding ruling with customs, um, and check, ask customs for a ruling, or to look at the cross system, which we'll talk about also. Um, but the importer of record ultimately has this responsibility for determining the classification. So we may use all these different tools, but we have to make sure that we do it correctly. So, hey, I'm the importer. What did I do? Maybe I looked, maybe I did reach out to receiving, but you know, now I'm looking at a harmonized tariff schedule. For those, most of us, have, well, I will say all of us probably have it online. And maybe there are a few of us who have the actual brokers, uh, sorry, the HTS classification book, which is, you know, a couple of thousand pages, right? Um, you get a really good workout from carrying that book around. So now we're looking at this HTS schedule with thousands of pages. And how do we figure out where to start? Um, do we use the dartboard method, right? Well, that kind of looks like my number. That one does too. So let's just, you know, open up the book and point a finger in there. Um, whatever's on our supplier invoice, that looks good. You know what? If it's free of duty, that's the one I'm taking. Or it's not subject to 301 um, special duties or anything like that. Let me do my tariff classification that way. Best guess doesn't work, okay? We really need to have a process as to how we do our tariff classifications. So the importer has to be able to provide customs with information, right? When we have an import invoice come in and we submit that to customs, that it went through our customs broker, but our broker does it on our behalf because they have power of attorney to submit documentation to customs. Well, importers have to provide customs with the documentation and information so the customs may properly assess duties, right? And customs also collects statistics statistical information on behalf of census the far under the foreign um, trade regulations, etc. And on the export side, same deal. If we are the US PPI, the US principal party in interest, and we're shipping out of the United States, census needs the correct information. So when we're providing a Schedule B number or a harmonized tariff number, when we file our electronic export information, or EEI, we have to make certain that that number is accurate because they're trying to collect trade statistics. They don't want messy statistics. They want really accurate, good statistics. So it's the legal responsibility of the importer and his customs broker to use reasonable care in entering merchandise. And this is why we can't do a best guess or point to just pull a page out of the book or let my three-year-old granddaughter decide which number looks the best to her. All right, we have to know which number it is. And customs responsibility is to fix the final classification and value. So how do importers meet reasonable care? 
And it's important to understand this when we're looking at the um, uh, how to do tariff classification, because as importers, our import operation in total needs to be managed in um, with reasonable care. So if you're someone who's just starting out with classification or just starting in the import position, you really want to find the reasonable care publication from customs and look at that carefully. Because as you're setting up your import program, whether it's for classification or valuation or country of origin determinations, we need to meet reasonable care. But these are some of the ways that we can do it. By by consulting with qualified experts, right? Seeking guidance from customs, providing brokers with complete and accurate information so that we can't just say to the broker, it's a rug from India. We do have to give them that additional information so they can help us make the right determination on the classification. Broker cannot, the broker cannot be making an independent classification uh, without your input. OK, um, and consistently classify products as well. So if we have this same rug coming in into the port of New York and then we have the same rug coming into the port of San Francisco, we need to make certain that we're properly classifying and consistently classifying that. OK, and the other piece of it is that make sure you check your entries. That's an important part of reasonable care also to make sure the correct classification was submitted to customs. So what are we talking about with the classification? So hopefully everyone on this line has seen a um, uh, 7501, but here's an example of what a classification would look like. And I took the motor vehicle one because it's really specific and it's got a lot in there, okay? Um, so you can see here that there's all sorts of information about what does a classification look like. And I also mentioned that there's a reasonable care checklist that you can be taking, um, that you can be looking at from the customs website. And if you, this is a really good slide to come back to and read because um, it's pretty lengthy. And these are only a couple of the questions, but in the event you're ever um, in a uh, focused assessment with customs, they will ask you these questions, all right, if you're to see if you are um, exercising reasonable care on your imports and in how you do classifications. So it's really important to be looking at this. So I just want to throw this out there for you. So what are some of the issues that we run into with classification? I just mentioned it's thousands of pages. Um, I'm old school. I have been doing this for a very long time. Um, and when I started out in this industry, you there was no on we had no computers. I used to type customs entries and have to erase eight to nine pages when there was never made in a uh, number that was put on that document. All right, with carbon paper, mind you. All right, that's a long time. Now that said, I love online because I don't have to walk around with that tariff schedule. But one of the problems with classification, I think we run into, is that customs has this. So we can get the HTS, we can access the HTS online, right? So, so we look at the HTS online and we do a search, but the search brings you to a page. It doesn't necessarily direct you through the steps of classification, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. Um, what are some of those other things that we need to do? Well, sometimes there is, it feels like there's some interpretation to the process. So how do I know whether I'm interpreting interpreting this correctly. Well, one of the most important parts of that is following the definitions that customs has. How do you know where customs definitions are? Well, they're in the general notes section. They're in the chapter notes. They're in the section notes. They're also in the explanatory notes, if you have a copy of those as well. There are places where we can get those definitions. But again, when we look at something online, we tend to go, okay, I'm done. I don't want to look at other chapters, all right? Um, and we do run into the, these, some of these issues. Sometimes we do not have insu insufficient, we have, do not have sufficient information that's available on the product. So in the case of the rugs that I discussed, maybe it makes a difference whether it's hand woven. That matters when you're doing classification. Well, someone may think that hand woven is, you know, sitting there and, hand weaving, hand weaving, hand weaving, but that may not necessarily be the same thing in the classification issue because maybe hand weaving is the entire process, not just a portion of that process. So we have to get this additional information. And who do we get it from? 
Sometimes our internal people do not necessarily have all the information on that product. We may have to reach out to the supplier to make certain that we're answering and gathering all the information we need to do a proper classification. So one of the biggest uh, problems with classification is not accessing the resources and the tools that are available. So if, if there's one thing I can stress to you and try to stress throughout this presentation today is the importance of reading the notes, the chapter notes, the section notes, and then the general notes also within the tariff schedule. Okay, just don't look at that one page that you're interested in or the one chapter you like. Um, you got to look around a little bit, okay? Get into those murky waters. It's okay. It's okay. There are no alligators in that tariff book, okay? It won't hurt you. So what I mentioned about this customs definitions. Um, so for example, if we are to be classifying baby clothes, okay, the expression baby garments and clothing accessories means articles for young children of a body height not exceeding 86 centimeters. All right, well, 86 centimeters is about 33, 34 inches. Well, what if the kid is just really long, right? It's a, it is a tall kid and it's clearly a baby, okay? Well, custom says in our description in our classification, as soon as that product is, as soon as that, um, uh, you know, if that, if that body height is for an extra long kid, right? It's different size garment. It's not baby garments anymore. It's, you got to go up a notch, right? Into toddlers or young children or whatever it may be. All right. So this is just an example of some of the definitions that we run into with CBP. And we need to follow those definitions, which is interesting because that's one of the reasons why it can be um, a nice tool is to use the cross system because we can sometimes read through some of these prior rulings that have some of these definitions in there as well and how they apply to someone else's products. Now, one of the issues is when it's someone else's product, you may not have the all the background history and what else was submitted with that binding ruling, okay? But that said, it sometimes is a helpful tool for us. So this is this training today or this webinar today is more about what tools are out there that can make our jobs a little bit easier when it comes to classification. Insufficient information, right? I have to classify a duck, all right, for whatever reason. Well, what kind of a duck is it? Is it a cartoon? Is it a live duck? Is it a wooden duck? Is it a home goods item that, you know, has some that's made out of iron? I don't know what kind of duck it is. Is it food? I don't know. Right. So when we talk about the fact that insufficient information can lead us down a path. So here is a live duck. Now, as far as a live duck goes, we can see that some of the information that's required here is just, hey, if it's duck, Customs wants to know how many there are. Good. We're cool. However, if, if let's say we were importing chickens, it may be more important as to um, what types of chickens they are, right? And even with the ducks, we see that it has to be something that doesn't weigh more than 185 grams on that duck for part of that classification. So does that mean we're gonna individually weigh each little duck that's being imported? Hopefully that's not your job and the supplier has indicated that information when you were importing those ducks. But maybe it's a toy duck. All right. And a toy duck would fall under some sort of a children's toy. So we need more information. OK. And again, I'm using this example of the ducks because there are just so many ducks and it's a product all of us can easily imagine. Now, there could be many different classifications for such as my dead duck. OK. Um, it, and I always say if you are a live animal and you're looking at the tariff schedule, you want to remain in chapter one because that's where live animals are. Because when you hit chapter two, guess what? You are now meat and awful and of whatever type of, um, whether you're a lion or a tiger or a dog or a cat, you're going to be a dead animal in chapter two. All right. But in this case, now we see it's ducks. Well, what, how is that described? Is it cut? It's not cut in pieces. It's fresh or chilled. It's frozen. It's only the livers. Okay. Look at all the classifications we could probably possibly have even just for a duck. Now, when we think about our own products, okay, we do run into where there's a lot of additional information that's required. 
So what are some of the resources and tools? As I mentioned, and um, this presentation will be available to everyone, um, so you'll be able to access these websites, but also if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to shoot me an email following the presentation, and I'll send you any other websites or anything that you may need. But the HTS, right? HTS has obviously a good place to start. The, uh, the Census Bureau has a search engine on the Schedule B numbers. Well, when you import, you have to have a harmonized tariff number. You can't tell Customs, hey, I have a Schedule B number because Customs doesn't want to know about that. All right. So what we want to make certain is that if you do use the um, search engine for Schedule Bs, Make sure you have to take that extra step and go now over to the HTS and see if it's the same number or not. They're not always the same. The general notes, all right, we're going to look at a slide with those in a moment. The section notes, chapter notes, explanatory notes. Again, I know you like, she already said this twice. I'll probably say it another two times before the end of the, of the webinar. Um, and then internal resources, checking with your people in product development, engineering and quality. Um, in, in, as far as your whole import process and import department goes, these people should be involved anyway because they may have information regarding valuation. They may have information about molds or assists that were sent to a foreign supplier. So we need to access these internal resources, not just for classification, but sometimes otherwise in our import supply chains. And then there's always you know, a customs consultant, customs brokers, or customs attorneys can also assist as well. And here's the link that I mentioned on the um, inform informed compliance publications. In fact, in the informed compliance publication section of the customs website, they actually have um, guidance on particular products, whether it could be glass beads, or it may be something on certain types of machinery, um, certain types of textiles. So you want to take a look at that because you may be fortunate enough that customs has issued an informed compliance publication for your industry. So take a look at that. Then you can take a look at the other ones for import compliance. So we talk about the breakdown of the tariff schedule, right? And if we were looking at it online, that general notes section, right? I can't speak enough for this on how important this is. But the way the tariff is set up is the change record. Okay, so I know that part of today's presentation is also to discuss some of the changes that take place. But basically, changes can happen to the tariff schedule on any day. All right, it just so happens that in 2019, all right, the year of COVID um, in June of 2019 was when the ball started to get rolling for merely making some updates and modifications to the tariff schedule for January 2022. So it's not like they did this overnight. It takes some time for the World Customs Organization because everybody's changing right, some of these numbers and things to make those changes. And we'll talk, I have a slide later on for some of those changes, but it takes time for that to go through. But there is a change record in the front of the tariff schedule so that if there was a change, you can see where the numbers changed or maybe something's new or was replaced. And in every part, every chapter of the tariff schedule, there are chapter notes. But in every section, so here you see I have the live animal section and animal products for section one, is section one has its own set of notes. So we really need to become familiar with that, with our products. And for most importers, um, we probably have more than one or two classifications. All right, which means that we may have to be familiar with the section and chapter notes of a lot more areas. Okay, so don't be afraid. We'll go into those orders. So general notes section, what I would like to point out here. Oh, general notes. That's got to be easy, easy, easy peasy. Go through that in a couple of minutes. No, it's 879 pages right now. All right, because the general notes encompass also the trade agreements the United States has. So while you look at the general notes section and the general rules of interpretation and such, that is the first page, and I want to point this out, I, have a, I think I duplicate this slide too, the general rules of interpretation, page one, all right, these are something we want to make sure that we're familiar with, uh, general rules of interpretation, they're on pages one and two. 
But if you are someone who has to go into trade agreements and look to see if there's a particular tariff shift or region, what is the regional value content required under USMCA or CAFTA, you're also going to find that in that general notes section. It's, divi it's divided up by the particular agreements. So uh, again, it's, it, and you're looking through a lot of pages and you're bookmarking and it's, it can be a lot to go through. But familiarize yourself with the general notes. Also, as we go through the tariff schedule and you're looking for different um, definitions, those are in there with customs as well. There are some in the general notes section and all of the acronyms that we see throughout the tariff schedule, we will find in the general notes section. Okay, so um, section notes, this gives you an idea of what the section notes look like. And the chapter and section notes, all almost all of them start out the same way. This section does not cover. Very important for classification, because if we just jump to um, our product in chapter 72, and we don't read, well, what did the chapter notes say? What did the section notes say? We may miss that, well, gee, if this is some sort of headgear, um, that's a metal headgear. Let's say it's a, maybe it's a, um, an arm or like a, a knight's helmet. Okay. That's made out of steel. We may think we should be in that in, you know, Hey, it's a steel item. I've got to be, you know, the hell of steel helmets have to be in chapter 72 is already three. Right. Well, maybe based on this, it's telling us, well, now nah, you probably have to go back somewhere else and go look at just to go check out chapter 65. Now there may be some in 65 that said doesn't cover steel helmets. Then you're going to get into the chapters a little bit more, but always looking at the section notes. It'll show this does not cover, and then it'll go into additional information, and then we'll hit those additional U.S. notes if it's something specific to importing into the U.S. Here's chapter 95, right? This chapter does not cover. Now, I don't know why someone would want to put um, candles under toys, games, and sports equipment. I don't know how what kind of game you're playing with a candle. Doesn't sound very um, safe, but Again, it's telling you right here in the chapter notes, these are the items that are not going to fall under there. <clears throat> and then there are also the explanatory notes. So the explanatory notes are not something you get online. Unfortunately, you have to get a subscription to these. There are organizations um, and, and publishing houses that have these. Um, but the, the um, explanatory notes also give a little bit additional information that goes down into the weeds a little bit more. Um, they're very helpful. Um, they can be more helpful with certain chapters than other chapters, but it's definitely something you want to take a look at. Okay, so I want to make a note about this particular slide, because if you're not familiar with the tariff schedule, we have a heading, subheading, we have statistical suffixes, there's always a nice description. Um, sometimes customs asks for additional information, this would be shown on our import entry, right, how many numbers, how many kilos, how many pairs, if you were importing skis or dozens, if it was shoes, whatever it may be. Um, if there's an X, they don't want additional information on that, okay? They don't need statistical quantities. Um, but when we're looking at that, that would be on our um, 7501 on the import side. And if we're exporting, sometimes census also asks the same information, right? Because they're also collecting trade data. The import side, customs is sharing the trade data with census. And on the export side, census is gathering the information. And guess what? They share it with other government agencies too. So we look at column one general, column one special, and column two. I just want to point this out because, again, if you're not familiar with the tariff, normal trade relations would be our, chap, our um, column one general, okay? Um, column one special would cover our uh, trade agreements. Where would we find those? Back in the general notes section, if you were looking to see whether or not um, your specific uh, trade agreement is covered here by an acronym. So those acronyms are listed by trade agreement, but also if you're looking for what, how do you qualify something for a trade agreement, you'll find some of that in there as well. And then the column two countries are countries, um, designated countries where the United States is saying, hey, we, you know, we have some issues with these countries and you're going to um, have to pay additional duties compared to these other ones. And you can see the discounts, right? That if you're importing chickens, all right, it's free of duty coming in under many trade agreements. It's nine cents um, per chicken. That's why customs wants to know how many chickens you're importing. Don't ask me if it's two-headed chicken. I think it only counts as one, but I'm not sure. 
And then um, if we were importing that chicken from, let's say, Cuba or North Korea, uh, you can manage that, or somehow the country of origin for the product, because it's basically the country of origin is what's going to determine the classification, and it's four cents each. So we have, as I mentioned, the chapter number, the heading, the HTS, all right? Um, and those are all going to be the same throughout all countries. But this stuff is where, at the end, is where it tails off, which is why we can't necessarily rely on what our foreign supplier says, plus other countries have their own way of um, determining the tariff as well. So um, again, remember I mentioned we have additional US notes, they, so do other countries, right? So we're not, we may never get to the same exact 10 from country to country. So in determining the duty, tariff description, right? We just saw that we see it there, right? Tariff description and the country of origin equals the duty rate. Now there are some exceptions to that. What are some of the exceptions? Well, if there's anti-dumping, if there's countervailing duties, and then if there's a little superscript, okay, on your particular um, HTS, you now have to go and down the rabbit hole of finding the superscript to determine what additional duties may be due, all right? So in this case, it had to do with um, the 301 tariffs in China but you need to follow the superscript to chapter 99 to see what the provisional tariffs are. And, you know, it's a lot of fun. But the, the key here is that um, that's how, that's what determines the duties. Now, sometimes you may run into a situation where you have American goods being returned or goods that have been previously imported. So there may be some circumstances of import that will, um, affect what that duty rate is, that's a situation you want to discuss with your customs broker, all right? And you want to have that proactive conversation, not when the goods are sitting waiting to get cleared or coming in on the flight tonight, because we want to have a conversation as to what documentation do we need to have for our records to back up that duty claim or not paying the duty claim. So here's where I mentioned about the trade agreements. You can see there's many different acronyms in there. This is all parts of part of the general notes section. And I always like to show this slide because back in the day, all right, Customs Modernization Act was in 1993. Um, these are the column two countries back in um, uh, 1993. And you see here, we just have Cuba and North Korea. So it's really interesting to see how this has kind of developed and changed around. Um, one of the questions that I also get is that um, right now, what, what's going on with Russia and Belarus, okay? Um, you notice that the column two countries state Cuba and North Korea, right? Those are countries that designated countries here in the U.S. Um, the HTS changes that are occurring with Russia um, don't necessarily cover every product that originates in Russia, but there are changes that are being made to the U.S. policy, suspending the normal trade status that we that we shared with Russia, okay, prior to the invasion of the Ukraine. So it's something that if you are um, going to be importing something where you know the country of origin is Russia, maybe it's not a direct import from Russia, but you can be buying something that's be, be, the supplier is shipping it from Canada that's made in Russia, right? Because country of origin is what determines the HT, the correct HTS rate. You want to take a look at that um, and, and be aware of that. So something you probably want to check with your customs broker on. I had mentioned that chapters 98 and 99 cover special circumstances of import and then also um, any temporary legislation when we have quotas, when we have 301s, we have 232s. So any different tariff issues, we're going to find those temporary um, tariff, temporary legislation if, where it affects the tariffs or in chapter 99. So we want to be just aware that these other chapters do exist because, again, many times we're only looking in the tariff schedule at what our commodity is, what is our product today. But there are sometimes ways to... Um, bring something in without paying duty on it, you want to talk to your customs broker about that. All right, so other details that we run into with the HTS itself, okay? You may not take a look at these because again, we go right to the chapter we want to look at, but you can also find the customs district and port codes in there, country ISO codes. Why would you want to use that? Some people want to know what, where it is. If you're taking a customs broker's exam, you need to know where these are unless you have them memorized. Um, so those are important things to look at. And there's also the chemical indexes, the uh, appendix, as well as the pharmaceutical appendix. There's also an alphabetical index to the, to the um, tariff schedule, okay? It's at the very bottom. If you look at the 
central page on the on online at the very bottom of that it says alphabetical index now the alphabetical index is a little tricky right if every product that's ever been created has to be classified between chapters 1 and 97 imagine what that alphabetical index how long that would be if it covered every product so you sometimes have to fish around. Sometimes the alphabetical index is based on, you can look to see maybe it's based on what the material is that your screw is made out of, or uh, maybe it's, it'll say uh, some type of machinery. Well, is it a handheld tool or not? Different issues. And I always like to bring up this screen because for the life of me, computers are not listed on the alphabetical index, okay? So if we take a look at, it, at the alphabetical index, this is one of the downfalls of using it. You have to think outside the box sometimes. So we look at the alphabetical index, computers are not there. You can see that I double checked this yesterday. I, I do this every time there's any change to the HTS. And then of course, cause I was doing this training, I said, I better make sure they're still not in there. Um, all right, so let's go with laptops. Well, there's a lapping machine. Okay, I don't want to know. It sounds like something like my dog would do, right? Uh, you know, lap, 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 lap with his kisses. Um, and then also, um, so we look at that, there's no laptop. But guess what? Computers are actually still remain under automated data processing machines, okay? So it's not into everyday man or everyday person, I guess I should say, language yet, but it's, it's, so you have to think a little bit outside the box. So next time you go to Best Buy or you're looking at Amazon, look at automated data processing machines. Don't look for computers or laptops. And I mentioned about the Schedule B search and the Schedule B search engine there. Um, describe your product. It's a duck, all right? Again, it needs more information, just like your customs broker is. In fact, in this one, I like how it says, is it plain weave fabric or is it poultry? So it's pretty much, okay, I can try to figure out where I'm going from here, but it needs more information, okay? So the more information we have about our commodity, our product, all right? And again, I use ducks because it's, the ducks are very simple. We all know what a duck looks like, although we can have many versions of a duck. Um, your own products, think about what's the additional information you need on those products. <clears throat> and we see again that the Schedule B um, will indicate still at that 185 grams and census indicates, oh, 6.53 ounces. So census, a little bit um, more everyday language because they show you the uh, actual ounces there. Okay, so record keeping. All right, we're going to go into the general rules of interpretation in a minute, but I just want to talk about record keeping for a moment. When you're making your tariff classifications and determinations, okay, what I find to be very helpful is keeping track of how did I come to this determination? Because I may be heavily involved in this classification project this week, but in uh, three weeks from now, or as I get older, it may be tomorrow, um, a month from now, I'm now reviewing how did I make that determination? I need to see the crumbs, right? The breadcrumbs that led me down the path to that classification. So records have to be maintained in the US. This is for all your import records, right? But also for your tariff determinations and classifications for your own sake, make sure you keep track of those breadcrumbs, okay? Um, and it's records that include you know, all of the A1A lists. So anyone who's not familiar with A1A list, familiarize yourself with it. And Customs has an informed compliance publication on record keeping. So you can check that out on that website also. All right, here, we're gonna do a quick brain break. I know I've been throwing a lot of information at you for the last few minutes. So let's take a quick breather here, okay? I'm still gonna speak, but you guys can take a breather. Your brains can relax for a minute. So I'm sure everyone's familiar with the X-Men. Okay, Marvel Comics, right? We have Sabretooth and The Beast and uh, Wolverine, all right? Everyone's favorite, I guess. Um, so I mentioned that you can go for a binding ruling with customs. And this is back from the 90s. It's still on the customs website. But Marvel Comics or was importing these dolls, okay? I always say they may call them action figures, but technically they're dolls. Um, these action figures and they had to make a class determination as to whether or not the dolls were of human features had human features or not which is the plight of the x-men i just love that so customs now takes this as part of their binding ruling and these are excerpts from the actual 
binding ruling. Dr. Doom's non-human characteristics include appearance of metal upper and lower extremities and a metallic head. So when you go for a binding ruling, customs asks for a lot of information. And I'm sure that in this case, um, Marvel Comics either submitted a sample at the time or a photograph of what Dr. Doom looks like, okay? But if you go and check this out on the customs website and you'll see that um, all the information about the uh, particular uh, X-Men and such. And it's really interesting because it gets into even this little funky part here about angels and devils and whether those that counts as human or non-human and it's fun, all right? But what you see is the level of detail that is required by customs when you do go for a binding ruling, okay? If customs receives a binding ruling from you, your customs broker, your customs attorney, whom, whomever it may be, they, and it's not complete or they have a question, because again, just like a customs broker may have a question, they may say, hey, what is that duck made out of? Um, the customs will come back and they'll bounce back the ruling and ask for additional information. So that happens as well. So let's talk about those general rules of interpretation. If you've never looked at them before, take a look. Page one of that general notes section, okay? Starts off with the them. Uh, but the general rules of interpretation are legal and binding rules that are used to determine classification. They're international rules, okay? So aside from the ones that say, and they'll always say, Less, okay. Um, the first four rules are to be used in sequential order. The last two rules are used only if needed based on certain circumstances. So I'm going to go through these a little bit quickly because we only have about 20 minutes left. But um, that said, if you have any questions on the, on these general rules of interpretation, again, you can certainly reach out and ask additional questions. So here are the general rules of interpretation. I didn't lie, they're on page one. And here are the additional US rules of interpretation. So let's take a quick look at this. So when we look at GRI one, all right? Um, and that's an, also an example again of what an additional US note looks like. So the table of contents, alphabetical index, titles, sections, chapters, whatever, provided for ease of reference only. So really what this GRI one says is you have to read the section and chapter notes, right? And if a heading specifically describes your product, that's where you're going to classify the product. And if it's not specifically in there, you're going to go to the next rule because I said they're in sequential order, right? That makes sense. So Anyone who has imported a screw knows that there are a lot of classifications regarding screws, right? Um, this just begins to speak about them a little bit. But what type of a head does the screw have? What type of material is it? How long is the screw? Okay, a lot of questions about screws, all right? Um, but if I find my aluminum screw and it's that one inch screw that's a hex head or whatever, then I'm in the right spot. Okay, and many of us are fortunate enough that when we do a classification, sometimes we find that product. But what about the other 500 products we import, right? We're not always able to find the classification so quickly. So again, here's just a little um, excerpt from uh, chapter 73 that shows bolts, you know, et cetera. And again, you see how customs gets really into is a round head, hex head, okay? What is it made out of? So again, we tell our customs broker, hey, I'm importing screws. And the customs brokers ask like five different questions and you're like, oh, it's just a screw. No, it's not. In fact, go to Home Depot or Lowe's and take a walk around where they have screws. You'd be like, oh my gosh, imagine all the different classifications for those items, which I would hope that after this um, webinar today, that you start to think about, hey, how would I classify that item, my mailbox or that uh, tool in my shed or something else, okay, to start thinking about that. And this is another issue that we run into also, classifying parts. Oh, that could be so frustrating, okay? Why is that? Well, when we look at the tariff classifications, right? We read the description in the tariff schedule. We'll see that sometimes it will say, and parts thereof. There we go. Great, I'm finished. This is a part, we're, we're importing these machines. This is a part thereof. Everything I'm importing falls under that. I have two descriptions, the, pro, the machine itself 
and the parts thereof. I'm finished with classification, but that's not necessarily true, okay? And this is a really important part of tariff classification. That's the easy way out, but it's not necessarily the compliant way out of doing classification. So the expression parts and expression parts and parts and accessories do not apply to following articles, okay? And this is just one of the section notes that I pulled, but we see that it says parts of general use, okay? Articles of chapter 82, right? Machines and apparatus. We, we can't always get away with saying parts thereof, all right? Um, and a screw is a great example. A screw is a general use part, right? A screw can be used in many different areas, okay? Uh, we I use screws, <laughs> which I probably shouldn't, for, you know, hanging up uh, sometimes a, a page out of my tariff schedule into my, into my um, uh, cork board. I actually still have one of those, but I use that sometimes because that's the only thing I have is a screw sitting on my desk, okay? Um, what is that screw being used for, right? Well, it's a general use item. It's not necessarily a parts thereof. So, so if we do have different types of bolts and screws and things like that, we washers, we may be looking at multiple classifications. So this is a really important rule to remember. And it's probably one of the most unliked, disliked rules of the tariff. Of the tariff. Um, sometimes we have goods that are unfinished, right? When we think of if we have a product coming in, and I'll go to my picture instead, we have a product that's coming in. If IKEA, right, we all know IKEA, but now we all, I'm sure, are familiar with Wayfair um, and obviously Amazon, right? But when we order something, unless we have expert assembly, that additional charge there, we're getting it something put in a box, all right? Well, when that product, that desk is coming in, all right? Um, Wayfair doesn't say to customs, hey, listen, it's a tabletop. It's 10 screws and do separate classifications for each part of that desk, right? If the whole desk is in the box, they're classifying as, as a desk, okay? And that's what this first GRI uh, 2A talks about and speaks to. So it's important for us to remember that because we may have stuff that's kind of broken down for, you know, obviously for uh, freight <laughs> freight uh, savings. Uh, instead of having five, 10, you know, 50 desks in a, in a container, we have 500 desks in a container, right? Um, so we want to um, think about that when the goods are incomplete or they're unfinished, right? Or unassembled. So we run into that as, as an example. Um, and then incomplete. It's what the good is, it requires finishing. Unassembled, all parts are in there at the time of entry, all right? Um, <clears throat> so we'll see those, those throughout the tariff schedule, sometimes even under certain um, uh, classifications or in certain chapter or section notes, uh, but it's important rule to remember, all right? So if you're someone who's been importing a finished desk, right, in a box, and you've been doing 10 classifications on that, guess what? You could have gotten away with those just going in a desk. Um, then we have 2B. So 2B has to do with when we have something that's, you know, combined and, and how do, what do we do when we have something that's a little bit of a mixture and how do we deal with that item, right? So I like this one because let's say that I have, um, we used to always use the example of Raisin Bran, right? You have Raisin Bran cereal you're importing. So you have some flakes, Bran flakes, and you have some raisins. All right. What is it more of? the raisins or the bran flakes, assuming there's no classification that says cereal with fruit in it or dried fruit in it. How do we classify that? So in looking at this rule, what we see is that we want to know, well, what makes up the majority of that item, okay? And we have to look at that carefully. So in this case, with the raisins, talking about the raisin bran, clearly we don't get even though the raisin comes first in the name, um, they're not, there are more raisins in the brand. So this would certainly be like more of a cereal, right? So that would be where we go with the classification. But what if it was something that was 50-50? Where do we go with the classification, right? It's two or more substances. It's classifiable in two different headings in the tariff schedule. Where do I go? Well, guess what? You go to rule three. So the, again, the hierarchy, right? The sequential rules to follow. Um, and I like to um, give you guys these types of examples because 
I think we can all identify with it. But again, going back to my previous slide, right? We have to look at, well, what does it say? And in this case, when we're looking at these bronzes and nickel silvers, right? And certain types of commodities we run into, we have to go a little bit further and look. And that's where those informed compliance publications can be helpful when it's something specific to textiles, for example, right? Textiles are always a little bit different because it goes by the weight, not necessarily by how much cotton it is, but maybe it goes also by the weight. So we have to read through those definitions and those requirements for customs for the tariff schedule. All right, another brain break for you, because I know just, they're like, oh my goodness, what, is a tomato a vegetable or a fruit? I'm not getting any feedback, so I'll tell you what, I'll give you the answer. Okay, so tomato is a fruit, all right? We all think of it as a vegetable because we've been told that, um, you know, that's why they're allowed to serve it in schools for lunch, I guess, right? But for trade purposes, a tomato is considered a vegetable. Identity crisis stems from an 1893 Supreme Court ruling that classified the tomato as a vegetable, so it could be taxed under tariff regulations. So there you go, this little piece of customs trivia for you. All right, well, you needed the brain break because look at GRI 3. Oh my goodness. We'll take it slowly but we'll take a look at it. So the heading which provides the most specific description shall be preferred to headings provided a more general description. And you can read the rest of this on your free time, okay? But if I have a window, okay, that's going in an airplane and it's safety glass, right? Think about it. Wow, I could possibly call this a um, airplane part or I could call it safety glass, okay? what is the better description, all right? We need to think about that. What's the more specific description, all right? And sometimes we run into this with a number of items. If there's things put up in sale for retail sale, we always wanna to check to see if there's a, a um, uh, classification for that particular set, all right? Sometimes there are for sets, but sometimes there aren't. So again, this is another one that we have to look at. It's packed for sale. Um, this is a toolkit. This is actually coming from, um, a binding ruling here, but um, we hear this term called essential character, right? So again, it's, sometimes it's not enough to say, hey, it's a screw. Well, if it's a screw that's made up of an alloy and it's a certain amount of this, it's not just steel, it's this and that, blah, 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 blah. well, you may need to have that additional information to properly do the classification to determine essential character. Um, 3A could also be if you have a number of items, right? We have a shaver that we're importing and I'm looking at, hey, it's a shaver or a hair clipper. It's electromechanical handheld device. All right. What is it? All right. Other, other. Oh, other. Do you, how many times are you in the tariff schedule that you see other in there? Before my husband and I got married and we were living together, I used to call him my significant other, other, other. Okay. Based on the tariff schedule. Um, but when we look on at the tariff schedule, what's the right classification? Because sometimes we have multiple classifications, uh, multiple headings that look really good. And if you are going through this exercise where you have a couple of classifications, you say, you know what, this is the time for me to bring in my procurement team, or this is time for me to bring in an engineer or somebody else within the company. One of the things that I would suggest is eliminating the tariff section of this so that the determination that's being made has nothing to do with what the duty rate is. I know for our businesses and our companies, that's important and that matters as to our landed cost, but we have to get the classification correct, not, not, not choose the classification based on, oh, I like that one because it's less than, all right? Um, so we want to consider that as well. All right, and then we have our hair clippers. So again, there's a lot of different classifications that we could be lo looking at this. So which one exemplifies the um, essential character of what those items are? Now we get into, again, essential, we have another mixture again. So there's my raisin bran, right? And here we go with um, the bar, if we had something else in there. So essential character. This becomes again important with customs. What's the essential character? So the nature of the material, the primary function of the product, which component contributes the most to that function, that may be the one that we end up um, kind of focusing on. 
could be the weight of the components, as I mentioned, with textiles that comes into play, um, the value, the bulk, et cetera. It's going to depend on what your commodity is. So when you're going through these general rules, you want to take a look at all of this. All right. And then I'm just going to focus really quickly on these last two because we're getting, headed, getting to the end of our presentation today. When goods cannot be classified by reference to 3A or 3B, all right, and you find out that they're equally, um, it, you know what, it's equally 50% raisins, 50% brand, okay, and you don't take the one that has the least amount of duty on there, right? The logical progression to the HTS is that you classify both items. So I classify my raisin brand if it's 50%, 50%, classify my raisins, classify my brand, whichever one comes numerically last in the tariff schedule is the correct classification. All right, so you classify both items or three items, whatever it may be, like in the case of our toaster, fryer, coffee maker. There's one other rule that we sometimes see, um, very rarely used. I actually had to search through the customs uh, cross rulings to find this item, which is a, <laughs> I don't know what this is. Um, and I hope anyone on the, I wouldn't be caught dead wearing this, but maybe, maybe uh, one of you have this. I don't know. Maybe it's good for hiking. I, I, I can't figure it out, but um, it's a wearable umbrella. So would you call it an umbrella? Would you call it a jacket? What would you call it? And in this case, uh, let's see, it's most akin to an umbrella. So custom said using GRI for it's an umbrella. So I don't know, it's a weird hat. It's a weird jacket. I don't know what you call it. All right, and then there's guidance on how we handle the packing of containers and things like that as well. All right, so one of the things I want to also mention is when you're looking at the tariff schedule, where these lines are, make sure you're lining things up, okay? When I have uh, maybe a chapter I've printed out or a section I've printed out, I actually use a ruler, okay? That's an old school trick, but so I make sure that I'm looking at things in this, making the comparisons at the same level for all tariff classifications. So you want to make sure you're doing that as well. All right, so as I mentioned, there's a hierarchy to classification. We have our section notes, the chapter notes. There could be subchapter notes, additional notes, and we also look at the headings and the subheadings, okay? That's how we're supposed to be looking at this. So starting with our classification and working our way up isn't really the right way to do it. So if you start it out that way, make sure you go back and look at your section notes, your chapter notes and bring it and, and then bring it on home, bring it on down to the last level. All right. Um, other items that we may use sometimes for classification. And certainly if we're going for a binding ruling with customs, um, we'll see that they ask for these, but drawings, literature, data sheets on the product, all right. Pictures of the product, sometimes a sample of the product that makes a big difference in seeing, seeing what something is versus looking at a supplier invoice that has a, you know, three word description about the product. What's the product's use, but also what other product capabilities? And also, if you're looking at something that you've inherited, all right, um, a database of classifications, one of the questions to ask is who did the classifications? All right. Um, you know, a lot of times companies say, hey, we're going to put these um, all these HTS numbers into our system and have it in our master database. But how were those how are those numbers actually determined? Oh, the foreign supplier did them. They may need to be updated. So you might want to make part of your compliance program going in and taking pieces of or areas of your classifications, kind of grouping those together and making certain that they're correct. Right. Maybe not doing it skew by skew, but classification kind of grouping in certain chapters or types of products. So these are some checklists to keep you going after this uh, training class and as you move forward. And let's see, tips to remember, review classifications pre periodically. Don't rely slowly on the OI broker because they don't have all the information, okay? Uh, don't choose based on the highest or lowest rate of duty. Please, please, please don't do that, okay? If you do that, customs will find out. And here's a list of these uh, websites as well. And I just want to talk quick about some of the changes that went into effect that I mentioned from 2019 to 22, 2022 when they finally came about. 
Technology is changing. So drones were added, cell phones were added, 3D printers were added, certain types of LEDs, all right, because that, that's changed so much. Right now we all have LEDs in our homes, right? All of that has been added and changed. And when we look at these classifications, um, in addition to that, some of the changes that were made also, since a lot of times the HTSs are also what governs our exports, some of the changes in, in there were made so that they would be more readily identifiable to government agencies for export enforcement purposes, that maybe a product has a specific an ability to do a certain perform a certain function. So on that note, coming right to two o'clock, do I have any questions? I see that there's questions in the chat. Okay. Uh, nope. All right, so if anyone would like to, um, here's my contact information if you have any questions. I know Kathy is making this available to um, the um, participants today, and I thank you for your time. Uh, thank you so much. Boy, that's such a very informative program. Um, I uh, just want to uh, thank you, Kelly, for uh, presenting us with this very, very um, timely and important topic. And again, if anybody has any questions, just reach out to me and I will get you in touch with Kelly or you can uh, email Kelly directly and we will be providing that information shortly in a follow up email. So at this time, I'd like to say thank you to all of our guests for joining us. Uh, be sure to tune in next week on August 3rd. We will be having our monthly supply chain information flow with our special guest, Stephen Nichols. At this point, I'd like to close out the program. And thank you all for joining us today.